like to begin by quoting Eliezer Berkowitz, who wrote in a book called God, Man, and History, that without evil, goodness would not be possible either. Without the forever lurking inclination to selfishness and discord, there can be no ethical ideal and practice. Former Surgeon General C. Everett Koop, speaking about the declining sense of professionalism among physicians, notes that, quotes, the hallmark of a profession is that its members place the interests of those they serve above their own, end quotes. Combining these two thoughts, I wonder, is it possible to inculcate professionalism in medical students without teaching them about the behavior of physicians during the Third Reich so as to forewarn them about their own, quotes, forever lurking inclination to selfishness and discord. Tonight's second speaker is eminently qualified to answer this question and, as well, to give us a contemporary definition of medical professionalism to enumerate the threats to sustaining professionalism in the commercialized world of contemporary medicine and to explain what medical education can do to bolster physicians' resolve and resistance to undermining their professionalism. Dr. Jordan Cohn is the, pres the president emeritus emeritus of the Association of American Medical Colleges. As emeritus, during his 12-year tenure, which just ended one year ago, Dr. Cohn launched many new initiatives for improving medical education and clinical care. Dr. Cohn also spoke extensively on the need to promote greater racial and ethnic diversity in medicine, to uphold professional and scientific values, and to transform the nation's healthcare system. In addition to serving as the AAMC's President Emeritus, Dr. Cohn is also chairman of the Arnold P. Gold Foundation, which advances human, humanism in medicine through innovation in medical education. And he also serves on the board of, of directors of many other distinguished foundations. Prior to becoming president of the AAMC, Dr. Cohn spent 40 years in academic medicine at many of the nation's most prestigious universities, including Harvard, Brown, and Tufts. And he was dean of the medical school uh, at State University of New York at Stony Brook currently is professor of medicine at George Washington University. Dr. Cohn has also held a wide variety of leadership positions, including chair of the American Board of Internal Medicine and the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, as well as president of the Association of Program Directors of Internal Medicine. A member of the American College of Physicians since 1978, he was awarded the prestigious mastership from the college in 1993. In 1994, Dr. Cohn was named a member of the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine. He is a graduate of Yale University and Harvard Medical School and completed his postgraduate training in internal medicine on the Harvard service at the Boston City Hospital, affectionately known to those who serve there as two and four. Dr. Cohn completed a fellowship in nephrology at the Tufts New England Medical Center. His chief areas of research interest were acid-based metabolism and renal ph physiology, and he has published more than 100 peer-reviewed scientific articles, co-authored three textbooks, and was the founding editor of Kidney Inter International's Nephrology Forum. Please give a big Texas welcome to Dr. Jordan Cohn. Okay, well what I want to try to do in the brief time we have is uh, see what lessons we can draw from the Holocaust about medical professionalism. And I want to, at the outset, uh, tell you I'm going to make a connection that you might find a little strained because I think the parallelism that I want to uh, establish here is, uh, is at a purely theoretical level, but I do think it has an important uh, uh, lesson nevertheless, and I hope, I hope you'll agree with me. Well, first of all, let me, let me just start at a very uh, uh, sort of basic level about the challenges that we're facing today in medical education. Medical education has always been challenged. Certainly those who are involved in medical education, I think, always feel themselves beleaguered with all of the things they need to incorporate in the curriculum and how they're going to communicate all that in the brief 
period of time, a seemingly brief period of time that students are actually in their educational domain. So in addition to all of the knowledge, all of the uh, traditional things, there are many things that we need to now prepare future physicians to deal with. They include cost containment, which is a huge problem that our country faces and will continue to face uh, for the foreseeable future. We've got to understand that we've got technological advances that are going to continue to accelerate in their uh, uh, importance and their potential impact on costs as well as uh, the, the positive aspects. The explosion of scientific knowledge generally. Uh, Teresa talked about the Human Genome Project. Huge, major increase in our basic understanding of human biology and the way in which we can translate that information into positive uh, treatments and, 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 and important uh, advances in our understanding of, of human biology and disease. Uh, we've got enormous disparities in health and health care uh, that we need to understand. Our students need to have an appreciation of to understand how they can continue to attack that. We've got large gaps in quality and in patient safety that we now understand uh, uh, are largely at the systems level where we need to incorporate a different kind of thinking about the way physicians and the environments in which they work uh, combine to uh, improve or not improve the, the quality uh, and the safety of the patients that are experiencing. And we've got uh, huge inequities in access uh, to healthcare services that need to be addressed. So all of these things, including the very large and unexplained variations in the pattern of clinical practice that are the, the cues, the clues to where we can find opportunities to improve the healthcare. All of these things need to be incorporated into our education so that we can truly align uh, the education with, 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 with public needs. So there's a huge agenda in addition to the traditional courses that uh, would normally uh, be included in the medical school curriculum that we have to contend with. But I'd like to say that there's one challenge that medical educators are facing today that, that eclipses all of these, that really does, I think, stand alone, and that is how to sustain medical professionalism in the face of the increasing threats from commercialism. And I want to dwell just a minute on the contrast between uh, uh, professionalism and commercialism. Well, first of all, what do we mean by professionalism? There are a lot of definitions uh, in the literature about this. The one that I particularly am fond of is this one. Professionalism comprises the behaviors by which individual physicians fulfill the profession's contract with society. It's based upon principles, requires that individual physicians adhere to certain responsibilities, principled responsibilities as they discharge their obligations to fulfill the social contract. By the social contract, I'm alluding to this sometimes vague, certainly unwritten contract or compact, if you prefer, between the profession of medicine in this case and the broader society, where in return for certain privileges and respect and autonomy in terms of setting one's own standards and applying the scientific basis uh, that we uh, use in dealing with our responsibilities, in return for the autonomy, we vow to use our skills and our expertise for the benefit of our patients and for the benefit of the public at large. That's the implied uh, contract. Well, the Charter on Medical Professionalism, that some of you may be aware of, which was uh, uh, the creation of a, of a very interesting collection of both United States and European physicians uh, representing these three organizations, challenged themselves with the uh, question of whether or there were some transcultural, certainly transatlantic, principles that one could articulate that would really stand scrutiny in the 21st century as an articulation of medical professionalism. And they came up with this physician charter, which has now been very widely acknowledged as being a, a, a valid statement of what we understand uh, in, in, in the early part of the 21st century, is what the, the obligations, responsibilities of physicians are based upon three principles uh, that are, uh, at least in the case of the first two, not novel. The physician, that the primacy of patient welfare, that's the one that harkens all the way back to Hippocrates, where physicians are always been for time out of mind obligated to use their skills for the benefit of their patients to place their self-interest 
in a subordinate position to the interest of their patients and the interest of the public. Patient autonomy, a principle that's of, of more recent vintage, perhaps the Enlightenment would be the place where we could see the roots of the notion that individuals are autonomous beings, that they deserve respect, they deserve to be in control of their own destiny to the extent to which they are capable and interested in doing so, that we need to respect that uh, patient autonomy as a, as a crucial element of the, of the founding, the foundation of, the, of, of professionalism. And the third, social justice, as far as I know, this was the first time that this was explicitly articulated as, a, as an underpinning principle, or an overarching principle, if you will, of medical professionalism. The notion that in the 21st century, in our modern contemporary world, we are dealing with such enormous social issues in terms of access, quality, distribution of resources, uh, uh, the potential rationing of healthcare services given the limited uh, resources that are available, that these issues of social justice were so terribly important in terms of the relationship between medicine and the broader society that they should be incorporated explicitly as a principle uh, in this uh, sense of professionalism. So the charter was articulated, and I wanted to point out that there is a, a reasonably wide uh, concurrence about the nature of medical professionalism in the uh, contemporary world that's at least in part uh, captured in the, in, in the verbiage in, in this document. Well, how does professionalism dis distinguish itself from commercialism? One buys this notion of professionalism that I've just articulated. Well, I'd like to, to use uh, uh, the terms that we apply to these two isms, if you will, uh, as ways of sort of pointing out the fundamental uh, dichotomy or contrast that I think at a very basic level really distinguishes the ethic of professionalism from what we understand to be commercialism. Professionalism deals with doctors, patients, trust between doctor and patient, key part of the relationship of the dyad between the doctor and the patient is that there is trust. Without trust, there is no way in which the uh, doctor-patient relationship can provide the kind of quality and improvement and benefits that accrue from that relationship. If patients don't trust their physicians, if there is no trust between the society and medicine, uh, we cannot expect to see the benefits from the uh, profession played out. Caring is a key element what we are trying to do as physicians. Uh, we provide services to our patients and to the public. We are driven by values. We have certain, as I've already articulated in terms of the charter, certain principles upon which we base our activities. We're striving for cures. We're striving for benefits for our patients. And we take pride in what we do. It is an important part of being a professional to have a sense that we are doing something important take pride in that, the job is well done. And what is our motto? The motto of the profession is primum non nocere. First, do no harm. Sort of another way of articulating the primacy of patient interest, that first we vow that we are not going to do anything that's going to be in the least bit harmful to our patients while we are trying to find ways uh, to improve their lives. Well, what does commercialism use as terms that sort of uh, articulate its uh, uh, its positions. Well, they're providers. How uh, I many doctors in the room enjoy being called providers? This is something that I always take a little bit of umbrage at. More so, our patients as customers. In the commercial world, we deal with providers and customers. We deal with suspicion when we enter into this relationship. It's always a question about whether the person on the other side of the commercial transaction is really telling you the truth, is really doing what's in your interest rather than in their self-interest. There's a lot of pandering that goes on in the commercial world. They deal with commodities. Uh, margins are sought. Profits rather than cures and bonuses at the end of the day, rather than just taking pride in a job well done without the financial underpinning. And what's the motto of the commercial world? Caveat emptor. So wouldn't you like your doctor to have over his or her office a sign that said, 
Beware, all ye who enter here. Right? <laughs> Wonderful. Well, and I, it's a little bit of a, a superficial analysis, to, uh, quite obviously, but I think this is not just a semantic distinction. These words have meaning, and words do have meaning, and they convey a sense of what is underlying the ethic and the motivation that is at the basis of these two ways of approaching transactions between human beings. And I would submit that there is a fundamental, absolute dichotomy between the commercial sense of what it goes on and the professional sense of what should go on. And that to the extent that medicine becomes just another business, we have lost an enormous asset in our society in the sense of having a set of individuals and a set of institutions that are devoted primarily to the interest of others. And the slippery slope of commercialism that worries me, uh, and should I hope worry everybody, is that starts fundamentally with an interest in oneself. And greed is perhaps an, except, an exceptional way of articulating that, but it leads to arrogance. It leads to abuse of power. Think about when, what went on in Nazi Germany in the time we're talking about here. Misrepresentation, lack of conscientiousness, undisclosed conflicts of interest, and ultimately, a loss of trust in medicine's social contract. And if we allow commercialism to erode the sense of professionalism, I don't think there's any way in which we can maintain this absolutely essential quality of trust that is at the basis of the doctor-patient relationship and is our, our relationship between the profession and the public at large. Sustaining trust is indeed what professionalism is all about. Choosing voluntarily, this is not by law, it's not a mandate, it's not something you go to jail with if you don't uh, adhere to it. Voluntarily, physicians are expected to place their patient's interest ahead of the interest of, uh, of others. That's the hallmark of professionalism. Medical education, in my view, has an absolutely vital role to play here because it must bolster the resolve of future physicians to sustain their commitment to professionalism despite what is always going to be present in the way of threats and temptations to deviate from that fundamental ethic. So what in the world does all this have to do with the Holocaust? Well, I hope it's obvious to you, and it's a, it's a rather, again, simplistic uh, uh, connection that I'm trying to draw here, but one that I think is terribly important for us to keep in mind. But what do we know about what doctors uh, did during the Holocaust? I hope all of you have had a chance to see this wonderful exhibit here in the, in the museum that, that is just a, an absolutely chilling uh, and very dramatic uh, evidence of the issues uh, that we're trying to raise here, what the doctors actually did uh, during that uh, uh, unfortunate period of, our, of history. First of all, the Holocaust was initiated, as we know, uh, under the aegis of this euthanasia program, the eugenics program, the racial hygiene program that all cultivated, culminated in, in a euthanasia, which was aimed to eliminate both through sterilization and ultimately through active uh, euthanasia, quote unquote, uh, undesirable people, that is Jews, gypsies, uh, mentally ill, physically disabled, and others. There was no way that was gonna happen without doctors involved in diagnosing these undesirable individuals, and moreover, to fashion efficient ways of exterminating those individuals. So doctors were at the very core of what transpired there. Now, I would say that it's clear that doctors participated, even volunteered of their own free will, not because they were required by the Nazi government to do so. There are some examples of physicians who refused to participate. Uh, we just There's one documented example in the exhibit of a physician who refused to participate in these activities, and he was not only ostracized from the profession, but he actually ended up being exterminated because he was undesirable as a result of that act. But generally speaking, I think the doctors uh, were not forced to uh, comply, but volunteered and very often did so uh, with enthusiasm. Now some, and I don't, I'm not a psychiatrist and I can't diagnose in retrospect, I think some 
very likely were uh, uh, intimately involved, may have been sadistic uh, individuals to begin with. Mengele, I can't believe that he was anything other than a psychopath. But be that as it may, the fact is that many, and I think arguably most of the physicians at the time, were ordinary, good doctors. They were in the medical profession, had gone through medical school, had written their theses uh, in the course of their education. They were part of the establishment, part of the good physicians uh, of, that, of that era. But without the acquiescence and the willing participation of a large part of the German medical establishment, there is simply no way the Holocaust uh, could have taken place. Uh, according to the uh, Berlin president of the German Medical Association, Elsa Huber, she said, today we know and must accept the responsibility that the medical community was involved and that that community remained silent. It was medical megalomania, in her view, that paved the way for the Nazi ideology and the Holocaust. Uh, I would take exception to the megalomania concept. I don't think it was megalomania so much as it was just the natural seduction that was present at the time that convinced these physicians to do what they did. Sherwin Newland, whose name appears familiar to many of you, wrote a review of, the, uh, of Deadly Medicine, which is another exhibit in the U.S. Holocaust Museum that, that captured the same theme about the eugenics movement and the way in which it led to the Nazi atrocities. What Sherman Newland wrote in a review of, the, of Deadly Medicine in the New Republic was this. To my startled amazement, the dismay rather, I found myself understanding why so much of the German medical establishment acted as it did. I realized that given the circumstances, I might have done the same. What we learn from history comes far less from the study of events than from the recognition of human motivation and the eternal nature of human frailty. That, to me, is the message that I want to uh, underscore in my brief remarks here. Because the bottom line is that the failure of medicine to adhere to its ethical grounding in the face of the seductive public policies is what allowed the horrific uh, consequences of Nazism to occur. The startling reality that the Holocaust teaches us is the ease with which a contemporary ideology, particularly one that promises a better future for the country, can undermine the doctor's core ethical obligations. Well, I would conclude from that that the Holocaust is not a cautionary tale about what it is or was to be German, but a cautionary tale about what it is to be a human being. The implications for medical education, I think, are very clear. Now, I want to again point out that to compare the dangers of commercialism's intrusion into contemporary medicine uh, to the total corruption of the profession that occurred uh, during Nazism is absurd. And I don't mean to suggest any kind of comparability or equality of these two isms. But I think at the fundamental level, the dynamic that's at play here I think there is a parallelism that I think we should be aware of and should be, I think, cautious, very cautious about. Because recognizing the ease with which good doctors can be led to act contrary to the public's well, patient's well-being underscores, it to me, the, that medical education has a vital role in strengthening this commitment of physicians to professionalism so that the temptations, in this case, to deviate from patients the primary support of patients' interest, to deviate to respect one's own self-interest, as in the commercial world, with all of the temptations that commercialization of medicine is now providing physicians, that's what we need to somehow figure out how to defend and, and prepare our, physician, our future physicians to withstand those temptations, because they are always going to be there. There's always going to be a, a seduction to deviate from this fundamental ethic of the medical profession. And I think as educators, we have to recognize that one of our primary responsibilities is to do everything we can to strengthen those qualities of character that our students bring to us and ensure that they are strong enough to withstand uh, the future temptations that they're undoubtedly going to be experiencing. Well, how are we going to do that? 
Well, let me tease out five ways in, in the final few minutes that I have to uh, uh, present to you. First of all, clearly we need to be cognizant that the admissions process to medical school is essentially admission to the medical profession. Uh, the, the percentage of medical students who leave medical school before they graduate is very small. The percentage is even smaller of those who finish medical school and fail to get licensed. So for all practical purposes, the admissions committee in medical schools is the group that admits individuals ultimately to the medical profession. So they've got a huge role to play here. They've got to not only identify individuals who have the uh, academic background and preparedness to, to take on the, the rigorous curricula that are involved in medical schools, but they also have to try to identify as best they can the character traits that we're looking for that can be the substrate of the raw material that can allow us as educators to ensure uh, that over the course of education and training, these professional qualities, the ethics of the profession become uh, strengthened. Well, I'd like to quote uh, 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 this uh, quotation. Knowledge attains its ethical value and its human significance only by the humane sense in which it is employed. Only a good person can become a great physician. And somewhat uh, interesting to see that this was a quote by a German cardiologist in the late uh, uh, 19th century. Only a good person can become a great physician. So one of the challenges that medical admissions committees have is trying to identify those good people. And I think they do an incredibly good job across the country. I think we can be very proud of the work that our medical schools do in selecting students for the profession because, and I always think it's even particularly true in this day and age. Sheldon, when, I, when you and I went to medical school, maybe not so great, but now it's terrific. Uh, the students coming into medicine today are, are by and large just enormously talented, very idealistic, highly motivated individuals, and I think as a society we can be very uh, uh, reassured that, uh, that our children and our grandchildren are going to have uh, be under the care of very, very exceptional individuals. But promoting that uh, uh, quality that is identifying those individuals is only the first part of the chore, it seems to me, that equally important and obviously uh, uh, throughout medical education, we need to nurture these qualities of character that our students bring to us, particularly recognize and reward humanism. Now, what do I mean by humanism? Well, let me contrast briefly professionalism, at least from my, what I understand to be the difference between professionalism and humanism and the relationship between the two of it. As I've already mentioned, to my way of thinking, professionalism is a way of acting. It's a, it comprises a set of observable behaviors so that we can act, actually evaluate students and physicians for whether they act in ways that we regard as being in keeping with their professional obligations. Now, that being the case, then it's perfectly possible for physicians or anybody to act as a professional, but not to really believe it, not to really have a fundamental commitment to those sort of cognate professionalism, if you will, or superficial professionalism. Humanism, on the other hand, in my way of thinking, is a way of being. It comprises a set of deep-seated personal convictions about one's obligations to others, particularly others in need. In talking about humanism, we talk about caring and compassion, altruism, empathy. These are qualities that are very difficult, if not impossible, to measure objectively and evaluate in an individual. I think humanism is what provides the passion that animates really authentic professionalism. And together, humanism and professionalism it seems to me, or what we think about as the virtuous physician, the physician that is, in fact, authentically motivated by a strong sense of commitment to other people's needs and acts in a professional way because that is the expression of those fundamental commitments. So that's why I think it's very important that we nurture the sense of humanism uh, in our students and make sure that we celebrate, reward humanism whenever we see it, find ways to uh, identify those individuals that exemplify those qualities and, and 
hold them up as exemplars of what we're trying to achieve. Similarly, that we need to reward and celebrate individual exemplars of professionalism, that this full expression of this ethic is one that we need to uh, have clearly in mind. And clearly, as all medical educators recognize, that it's not so much the formal curriculum whereby we can communicate these values, but it's the what's called the informal curriculum, those relationships that students observe between staff members, between their attendings, between their attendings and their patients, between the nurses and the doctors, the interactions that occur in the domain, in the learning environments where our students are gaining their professional experiences are really what communicates what the profession believes fundamentally. It's not so much what we say, but what we do that communicates who we are and what we really believe in. So it's very important that medical educators take account of the learning environments and the way in which these informal relationships or these informal uh, messages get communicated to our students in this context. But finally, I do want to point out that the formal curriculum has a very important role to play because the cognitive rationale that I've tried to briefly uh, summarize tonight, if we're adhering to the precepts of professionalism, I think are very important to understand. And in this context, I can't think there's any better example of that than uh, the teaching of the Holocaust. Holocaust is unquestionably an extreme example uh, but I don't think we should at, at, in any time think that it can be dismissed as a one-off or a unique historical event that can't be repeated. Maybe not repeated to the uh, atrocious extent that it was in Nazi Germany, but even a small dose of Holocaust is more than I think we should ever uh, be willing to tolerate. Experimental psychologists, in fact, I think have, have shown us with, with abundant data that uh, good people can be made to do very bad things given the right set of circumstances. Good students can be, in these experimental psychology circumstances, be induced or seduced to do some things that would be, just be absolutely off the charts if they were to think about it uh, in a, in a uh, theoretical context. So we are, as human beings, I think, all prepared to act in, a, in an immoral, uh, unprofessional, uh, and bad way uh, if the circumstances uh, are so uh, appropriate to, uh, for that to happen. Good doctors, clearly, we've learned, can be lulled into doing very bad things by public policies, norms, and by the ideology uh, of the day. And again, without putting too fine a point on it, I think we are faced as a medical profession today with a commercialism ideology that is masquerading as some way to improve uh, the way in which medicine delivers its services to the public. The marketplace uh, has taught us a lot of good lessons, but it clearly is not the place, in my judgment, for the fundamental ethic of the profession to be uh, played out and to produce the benefits to society that is capable of doing. Uh, and until, unless we recognize the threats that are there and the tendency of all of us to succumb to those threats, if we don't have a firm foundation in humanism and professionalism, I think we are at risk of our society losing a tremendous value, a tremendous asset in this trusting profession uh, that we've come to recognize as medicine. So a study of Holocaust by medical students, I think, uh, can go a very long way to ensuring that uh, we transmit these uh, uh, messages, that we strengthen their resolve uh, to sustain their professionalism throughout their lives. I wish, and I'm sure Sheldon agrees with this uh, wish, that uh, the Holocaust were more widely understood by medical students, that it was incorporated more uh, thoroughly into the medical school curriculum. And I think we need to find ways to communicate the power of these messages for medical students and find ways to uh, stimulate more wide adoption of these lessons from the Holocaust.